Welcome to the eighth episode of VS Demol 2017 Recaps from Reality TV Warriors, where the fun never stops. My name is Michael Armstrong, and joining me as always is the Canadian who has a habit of lowering his beard whenever someone asks him to, Logan Saunders. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I warned you that this episode was a bit of a weird ending, and I wasn't lying. Logan has seen the start of the next episode as a result of this, so we will be discussing the, the results of the execution at the end of the episode, but what a weird episode. What a weird structure. Yeah, I was thinking, man, when I was watching, I was thinking, there are some parts that are really dragging. We're seeing a lot of conversation for a Final Four episode. And then once I noticed there was about three or four minutes left in the episode, I'm thinking, oh, they're not going to execute anyone, are they? But they do execute somebody within the first four minutes, five minutes, I think, of the following episode. So it's like, well, that's just a waste of a cliffhanger. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why they did that. I know we'll end up talking about this at the end of the episode, but I don't know why they decided to just cliffhanger it. The only thing I can think of is that, like, normally we've talked about this before, but the difference between Belgi and Vidim is that Belgi will do the reveal in the final three episode by the end. They'll have that occupy the last, what, six, seven minutes of airtime? Roughly around that. While with Vidim, they don't do it till the reunion after the final three episode, like the American version. And because Vidim has a much longer running time than the American version, that means you have a final three episode that has to run for about 60 minutes or so. And we've talked about it time and time again. The final three episodes always really drag with lots of recaps and reflecting stuff so maybe they decide hmm it's a bit more exciting to try and find material when there's still four people left and have conversations as opposed to try and really drag things out with three people left so at least in the final three episode they can do an execution to occupy the first six minutes or so so that takes away six minutes of recaps and reflecting so maybe that's why they did it yeah but you know as well as i do they haven't done it since they didn't do it in georgia what about renaissance how they structure it in renaissance with with peggy's elimination they had one more challenge they had a challenge and then the execution i think yeah they have the challenge peggy's execution then the last two challenges and then it was the end right yeah they've done it twice before anyway with the peggy style one where it's challenge execution challenge challenge then final three test but this is the only time at least to my knowledge where they've done the execution at the end of the final four episode and then gone now we're not going to show you who gets executed just yet you've got to wait till the start of the final three episodes to find that out yeah i guess they just want to create that extra elimination because that's an extra few minutes they can dedicate to it yeah it's just really odd it's one of the main reasons i wanted you to watch this season is because i thought i wonder how he's going to react to the reveal of nobody going home at Final Four, technically, and then that getting carried over to Final Three. Yeah, having more than one non-elimination episode isn't really a good idea for Vidim. Meanwhile, was it China that had three non-eliminations? Yeah, China had three in the last, like, six episodes. They had, they had, the, double, they had the double elimination, and they had Final Four. They had a final four instead of a final three all the way to the end. Yeah. So previously, the final five continued on to bend. In the lava field surrounding the Deerite Observatory, Emanuela spied a kink in the carbon, as Etta Discipline was not adhered to when passing on information about themselves. A road trip saw Emanuela and Diedrich soar, while the other three rode around in a convertible. At an individual shooting challenge, Thomas set the fastest time, but he was the only one not to bring any money in for the pot. However, it was Emanuela whose balloon burst, as she was the sixth person sent home. And they are still in Bend. Art says that Emanuela was still convinced of her mole, another victim of Joachim's alliances. Four people are left, Dree Manor and Sana, which is one too many for the finale. To leave now before the finale would be devastating, but it's going to be a big surprise to the other two who make the finale when they find out what went on behind their backs, and sometimes in front of their eyes. And the episode title is Window Language. It's day 14. Sana says she's worried that it's getting a little bit too cosy. Diedrich suggests that they all stop sharing information with each other now. And then Joachim tries to meddle with Thomas and Diedrich's bond. And then Art meets them at Painted Hills for the first challenge. And for once, Sana gets to introduce it. 
Art gives them a science and history lesson about the location before announcing that they will be spread out over the hills. They will find letters of the alphabet and have to take letters with them to put them in alphabetical order. If they are correct after 20 minutes, they will earn a thousand euros for the pot. It's funny how we get a geology lesson from art. It is, and it distracts from how rubbish this challenge is. (laughs) This is genuinely... And I think it's partly due to the fact that obviously the team come nowhere near close to completing this. But this is genuinely one of the worst challenges I think we've ever had to recap. I think it's closer to being one of the most impossible challenges, too. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, we love a challenge that a mole can sabotage that is actually a possible challenge. This one is an impossible challenge that a mole doesn't really have to do much to sabotage. No, because they're given a really short time limit to do a lot. Yeah. We always have a bit of a rant when it comes to this sort of a challenge where we go, seriously, the mole doesn't have to do anything here. The mole can do one sabotage and ruin everything. All they have to do is pick up a letter board, throw it into the grass, and the mole wins. I don't know whether the mole did that in this challenge, but that was my first thought as soon as I saw this challenge again was, the mole just has to take one board, throw it into the hills, jobs are good, they can't win. It's too easy for the mole to sabotage this one. Yeah. I mean, just even as if you had zero moles, this is still a tough challenge to do in 20 minutes. Yeah, especially as they give them no instruction about where the ends are. No instruction about where A should be, no instruction about where Z should be. They get absolutely nothing here. So Sana starts with the M and Thomas the Z. Diedrich says the only way to win is to work out what the start and end points are as soon as possible. He rides 500 metres past what he thinks the last pole is, and then draws a Z in the sand underneath to help the rest. Thomas finds a B where he thinks the Z should go, and then swaps them over. Diedrich continues drawing letters in the sand before passing Joachim. Diedrich has gone completely the wrong way, at least according to Joachim. He then pedals in the wrong direction, much to Diedrich's fury. Thomas and Sanna also meet up. Sanna has been putting the high letters at the beginning, and when Thomas goes further up, he notices that she's put O, P, and Q in the wrong order. Joachim reaches the last pole and sees an N there, despite Diedrich apparently telling him that the Z was already there. They then have an argument about what Diedrich said, and Diedrich by this point just looks exhausted with everything. Yeah, he tried his best to come up with a way to efficiently perform this challenge, and Joachim doesn't get it, and then by the end of it he finds out that Sana didn't get it either. He's like, oh, why did I write the letters beside the post? And I bet you, because he stopped to put the letters beside the post, that that meant they still had no chance of winning because that wasted too much time for bike pedaling. Mm. He just looks absolutely exhausted by this entire challenge. Yeah, it's weird that they're in this crazy landscape that doesn't really exist in almost anywhere else in all of the US. The red layers and the yellow layers and all these different colors. And then it's, oh no, the challenge will be all of you will bike on this trail and you have to put 26 letters in alphabetical order. Like, that's a weird usage of that very unique landscape. Yeah, it doesn't feel like they use this landscape very well. And then they don't get they don't get walkie-talkies either. They don't get the portaphones. No, it's just absolutely impossible, this challenge. There is no way in hell the team were going to win this. Mole or no mole. I think if they had the portaphones, it would still be a tough challenge to do in 20 minutes. Yeah, because the mole could still just hold the button down. I know we say this any time there is an etta discipline challenge, but the mole could literally just hold the button down and stop anyone else being able to talk. Yeah, but at least they'd be able to get some communication in. Like, they rarely run into each other in this challenge. Thomas briefly runs into Sana. Diedrich doesn't run into Sana until, what, 10 seconds left into the challenge? And he got he had a bit of interaction with Joachim, and that was it. So it's like they didn't run into each other. They'd have zero idea of who had the right order. I mean, we still had half the contestants not know what the order was not not really understand the challenge i would say because that's a weird thing too to not be able to know what's the starting point what's the end point yeah it's one of the weakest challenges of the season i would say i don't think there's any doubt in that yeah so just weird decisions all around i would say a good difficulty for the way this challenge was set up is give them 30 minutes i would say yeah, or at least give them a chance. That's the thing. Because they didn't have any walkie-talkies, because they didn't have any indication of where A should be and where Z should be, 
it's just an impossible challenge to mess with. But yeah, if they had 10 extra minutes, considering they had about half of it figured out, maybe a little less than half, if they had an extra 10 minutes, I think it would make it a coin flip as to whether or not they would pass this challenge. Yeah, I've just looked at Bindle's challenge guide, and every single challenge in this episode got a C plus grade. And I think he's being very generous to this challenge. Yeah, it was just an odd challenge overall. Just the odd production decisions behind it. Yeah, I don't think they're intending on the team winning this challenge. Yeah, I know they like to do a letter or a word type challenge towards the end of the game. So this is one of the easier challenges they can do, but... This one needed to be a 30-minute time limit, and then I think it'd be reasonable. It'd be a reasonable difficulty. I think it also doesn't help, and I know we're spoiled with Belgium, given that this is the season we've literally just finished recapping, actually, when we're recording this. But the actual challenge and the location feel very disjointed. It feels like they had this idea, and they had this location, and they thought, yeah, let's just put them together. But they just don't mesh. It doesn't feel like an Oregon challenge, this one. And given that this season has been so good with linking its themes to the challenges, it just feels very disjointed having this challenge. Oh, I like the one Diedrich quote, which is, just kill me after he deals with Joachim, when Joachim screws up the understanding the challenge for the second or third time. I think Diedrich is both exhausted by the actual challenge itself and just exhausted by having to deal with these people by this challenge. He's just so over them. And then when he runs into Asana, he says, she writes books for a living. You can't find a more linguistic person than her in our lifetime. <laughs> I think Art potentially has the quote of this challenge for me, though, because when, <laughs> um, when he's debriefing with them, he just doesn't hide his contempt for them. And for Belgium. Yeah, he confirms to them that the Z was the only piece in the right place, but their alphabet starts with the Q. It must have been the Flemish one. And you can see Belgian Thomas in the background just laughing at him for that one. It's like, I don't know what alphabet it was. Maybe Flemish? Also, I have remembered since the last time we actually discussed Thomas being Belgian. I think he is the first Belgian contestant, but there has been one since. And I only remembered it after editing one of the previous episodes in this season. Because Evie was Belgian as well, off of Colombia. Oh, okay. You know, the one who everyone suspected until she went home in week two. Oh, the Expedition Robinson host. Yeah, she was Belgian. Oh, she still is Belgian, as far as I'm aware. She was Belgian. She converted. As far as I'm aware, she is still Belgian. So after the challenge, they arrive at their hotel, and Sanna mounts a coup to try and separate Thomas and Diedrich. It doesn't work. And Joachim tries proposing a bond with her, given that she's asked twice when he's been taken. Now she's his sloppy thirds. And she says she went all in on him the past two tests and survived. He's lost two women already, so who else could it be? Joachim then proposes that they share lists. She says it's helpful, so she has the most knowledge about her mole. He makes an ultimatum. Who does she want to go to the finale with, him or Thomas? And her reaction is... confused, at best. It's also our banner reaction this week, because Sana's inability to hide her reaction to Joachim in this scene is very entertaining. But they do end up making a finale bond. If you pause Joachim's face at the 19-minute mark, he makes the weirdest face I've ever seen when they're discussing their bond. I knew I wanted Sana to be the banner for this episode just because she made me laugh as I was actually watching it. And when I went back to try and get the screenshot for the banner, I just couldn't stop laughing at her looking very confused at Joachim, then trying to hide her laughter, and then remembering she actually has to have a poker face at some point. It was just a very fun reaction. And I know I've said this numerous times this season. I wasn't that high on Sana when I originally watched this season. She was all right. She was there. She wasn't Emanuela, so I didn't care that much. But she's sneaky funny in these episodes. I know she's a comedian by nature, so she kind of should be funny. But she's sneaky funny in some of these episodes. She's always good for a reaction, if nothing else. It's just the most uneasy bond I've ever seen made since Yakima had already rejected her twice in the past. And he's like, well... I guess I'll trust you, even though you just told me you've gone all in on me on the quiz for the past three rounds. I guess you can be my sloppy thirds. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I mean I'd mean, i rather it be Secret or Emmanuel, but I guess I don't have much choice at this point, do I? So Diedrich also says that he's worried that Joachim and San have a bond, but it's nothing compared to the bond that he has with Thomas. This isn't foreshadowing for 
the back end of this episode at all. <laughs> and they are driven to Redmond, the antique capital of the United States, for the second challenge of the episode. Have you heard of Redmond before, out of interest? Could have sworn there's a Redmond, Washington. There is a Redmond, Washington. It's where Microsoft's from. Yeah, that's the Redmond I know. <laughs> it's also the Redmond I know, because it was the one I first thought of when Redmond came up as a captain in this episode. I'm like, have they gone to Washington? And then they explain that it's the antique capital of the US, and it's like, oh, that's something to be notable for, I guess. It's the antique capital of America. One of the weird things about the States is that I believe there's a lot of cities that share the same name in a bunch of different states. Yeah, there are. As you might be able to guess, I'm not wonderfully high on this episode. I really don't like the exemption game that ends this episode. I think it's a completely rubbish challenge. We'll get to that in a bit, because I have some thoughts on that as well. But this second challenge is easily the best one of the episode. This is just a fun challenge. Yeah, it's the best one of the episode because it's essentially just a character challenge again. We love a character challenge on this podcast. It's essentially just a character challenge and the final four just pissing around with each other. And it's the only challenge where they can actually earn any money. So, yeah, basically anything cowboy-themed you can think of is available in Redmond. Art tells them that they'll need creativity for the next challenge and need to split up into pairs now. Diedrich and Joachim and Sanna and Thomas pair up. They will get a list with Dutch proverbs and phrases and have to take pictures of them with the antiques that they will find. Each correct phrase identified by the other team is worth €100 Euros for the pots, and they have 45 minutes each and 10 Polaroids in the camera. Diedrich begins by describing their shop as an Alice in Wonderland of crap. Do you notice Diedrich's shirt in the first challenge? Was it the video game one? The NES shirt, yeah. Yeah, because he's worn it in another episode as well. Yeah, what was it? Classically raised? Classically trained it was, I think. Classically trained, yes. that's Yeah, Yeah, Diedrich does have some cracking shirts, I have to say. And then Thomas is wearing his 94 shirt in Roman numerals once again. He is, because he's only got about three t-shirts, one of which is the Say No to Racism one, which went well for him last time. Yeah. And Santa and Thomas decide to each pick a saying and then focus solely on that. Their first is looking a gift horse in the mouth, and they find a horse toy, and Thomas gets headbutted by it when trying to look into its mouth. Joachim then holds a dog in a pot and looks confused. Diedrich says that their photos are all about capturing the right emotion. He takes a picture with a saw and a red chair. Thomas then finds a car door, and Santa insists on making their scene cosy, and he pretends to fall through the door, because that's part of the proverb, apparently. Joachim grabs a rubber chicken to represent you can't pluck a bald chicken, and somehow one of Santa and Thomas's pictures flew off in the wind. Santa finds it suspicious, but Thomas can't imagine that one just got up and flew away. And now we get to the one that I had forgotten about, and the one that I think probably would not have aired had this aired in 2021, and that is Joachim trying to represent coming out of the closet. Yeah, I was I was very surprised. I'm thinking, wait, are they saying what I think I what I think they're saying? And then Joachim dresses up in pink, and he's trying to strut around and make a an interesting face. I'm thinking, oh. No. <laughs> the worst thing about this is the fact that they are asking the other team to identify this, and openly homosexual man Thomas is one of those people guessing. And he gets it right away. Yeah, I have to suspect that there may have been some conversations off air about that one. I'm surprised that proverb was included in, because you, you're just asking for offensive stereotypes if you include that proverb in, because it, it would be an easy one to do. It's like, well... On the one hand, the audio, half the audience is going to hate us, but on the other hand, I would like 100 euros in the pot at this point. Yes, 100 euros being cancelled on Twitter. It's a difficult balance at this point. And Snapchat, apparently. Well, yeah, that as well. So Sanna and Thomas get 9 of the 10 that Diedrich and Jochen took, and Diedrich and Jochen get 8 of the 9 that Sanna and Thomas took, giving them a total of 1,700 of 2,000 for the challenge, 1,700 of 3,000 for the episode, and 12,010 euros of 53,250 for the season so far. And we definitely get the molliest thing of the whole challenge, which is one of Sana and Thomas's photos flew away in the wind, apparently. And all I can think is one of them's got to be the mole, because that's a very, very molly thing to have happen in a challenge like this. Just lose one mysteriously to the wind. That's a huge red flag. I must admit, I was trying to remember when rewatching this challenge whether that was a mole action or not. I can't remember. 
Yeah. I was thinking, oh man, that's uh, I mean, those two are pretty much top two on my suspect list, so that doesn't help things. I wish they were split up. <laughs> I wish they were two separate groups, and I would be like, yep, that person's my number one suspect now. I must admit, this episode is way more interesting watching it on a rewatch than actually watching it at the time. Because, obviously, I know what happens in episode 9, as do you now. But because I know what happens in episode 9, all of the seeds that are planted in this episode, you go, oh, yeah, I get it now. That's interesting. I like how with the the X'd out box photo, how Thomas is like, man, I looked like a bad Backstreet Boy. No wonder they couldn't guess what I was. What can I say? He's a larger-than-life character. So, they wake up on day 15. Sana says she said yes to a bond with Joachim because he's the mole, but he says he survived by voting for Diedrich the past few tests. Did he lead Emanuela and Sigrid to suspect Diedrich and go home as a result? She admits to him that he has been her mole three times now, twice fully, and one half. He says that's impossible. He admits the last three times he's been on Diedrich, so it's weird that they're both still there. She tells him that Jeroen went home suspecting both Diedrich and him. If Sigrid and Emanuela went home suspecting Diedrich, and she's still here, that means that they were more wrong than she was with Jochen, leaving just one person who she's never, apart from a brief moment, suspected, Belgian Thomas. Jochen says it makes sense, but he doesn't necessarily trust Sanna. Art meets them for the final challenge at Fort Rock, one which will guarantee them a spot at the reveal. They will be blindfolded and spread out across an area equidistant to a pole with an exemption tied to it. All they have to do to earn the exemption is take it from the pole without being seen by anyone else. If they are spotted and their name and colour is given to Arto with the walkie-talkie, then they are out of the game, and the same will happen if they give an incorrect combination. And the game will continue until someone claims the exemption. This was almost a broken challenge, I would say. Yeah, you know how midway through the season I started talking, I think it was on a Bindles episode, about how this season, in my mind, is notable for challenges and other things just going wrong for production. Everything happens that shouldn't happen for production. I think this challenge is another one of them. I think they fully intended on this challenge not ending up being people sitting in an Oregonian field for two hours, waiting to see if they could work out what colour the other people were wearing. I think they were expecting people to rush for it. And as soon as Santa gets caught rushing for it, everyone else sits on their arse for two hours. Was it two hours or was it longer? I think it was about two hours. I don't know for certain, but I think it was at least an hour and a half. I don't know. It might have been longer. I mean, just the footage that they show makes it seem like it went on for a long time. Yeah. This is, I would say, the worst Final Four exemption challenge they have done in years. I think I would add and say this is probably the worst Final Four exemption challenge I've ever seen, or just or in general. <laughs> Yeah, bearing in mind we had, what, four years before this? A challenge where someone won an exemption and then had to defend it by playing a laser game from a helicopter. And then fast forward four years later to an exemption game that is literally at Final Four, sitting in a field waiting to spot each other. I guess the closest challenge I can think of for Belgi is the Hunger Games challenge. Where they did it with, what, five? Five people were in that one? Six. Six? Hans was six? Okay. Because that one that one was a similar concept, where they had the exemption in the middle of the field, and then there was a big fight for the exemption. But they had lots of other elements to it, potential to earn money, lots of twists and turns throughout the, what was it, 90-minute or two-hour time limit, where it was really fun to watch and really exciting to watch. And then here, it's just very, very bare bones, where it's just, okay, you're in this field, there's going to be the exemption here, and if you get caught trying to take the exemption, you're out of the game, and whoever claims the exemption wins. But the field wasn't thick enough for them to really hide through, so it just becomes a game of whoever gets closest to the pole is going to get found out and eliminated, and the person who's going to win is just whoever doesn't go for the exemption. Yeah, the difference between this and the Hunger Games challenge in Belgi is obviously the fact that they were adding additional requirements. So they basically always had to be on the move in the Belgi one. And they could directly eliminate each other, rather than just calling out on a walkie-talkie and saying, 
Joachim Green, they actually had to shoot each other with paintball guns. And there's a bit more activity in that, rather than Joachim essentially winning this exemption by doing absolutely nothing. Like Luigi. It's like the Luigi meme from Mario Party. Luigi wins by doing absolutely nothing. And, well, at least Joachim actually presses his finger down on the walkie-talkie and says a few words to Art twice during the game. But, yeah, that's as close to doing absolutely nothing that somebody has done for an exemption outside of, say, the early rounds of the American version where people just stumbled onto exemptions without even trying. Yeah, it's an incredibly passive way to earn the Final Four exemption. Yeah, usually it's like really, it's usually a really tense battle whenever they go for, if there is an exemption at Final Four, it's like, oh, who's going to get it? Who's going to get it? What's going to happen here? What strategy should they use? Here it's not the case. It's just, hmm, this field does not have thick enough the bushes and the uh, brushes aren't thick enough, especially towards, it seems like the closer they got towards the exemption pole, the more it thinned out. So then it's like, well, all we have to do is wait for them to get to the pole or get close to it, and then call in their color, and we'll probably get them out. And the worst part is they didn't use obscure colors. It was the four most common colors possible. Red, blue, green, yellow. So you didn't even have to really... I mean, Diedrich almost just threw it... He had a guess for what Joachim's color was, but was too scared to call it in. I have two more points on this, one of which is on the subject of the colors. It is very convenient how the two colours that were left at the end were green and yellow, which are closest to the colour of the actual scrubland that they were playing in. And number two is, from a production standpoint, going back to my original point on this challenge, Joachim winning is the worst case scenario, I would say, because he is the least fun of the four left, and you're now guaranteed to have to put up with him till the reveal. Yeah, because... This challenge is set up with whoever has the most passive strategies guaranteed the exemption. So, of course, it means the most passive player is going to be the one who gets the exemption. I know when he listens to this, Nick is not going to be happy bunny with me for slagging off Joachim, but Joachim is by far, I would say, the least fun character of the Final Four. Imagine if Emmanuel was in this challenge. Yeah, exactly. One round later, and Emmanuela could have potentially got her way to the finale with this. And imagine her reaction. Is there a strategy you think where you can claim the exemption? Like physically, not 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 the Yakum way, but to actually get to the flag? I don't think so. I think the only way to win this exemption is war of attrition. And just sit there, try and find a good vantage point, but sit there and and just try and knock each other out on the walkie talkie. Yeah, I'm curious if there was an unofficial time limit for the challenge. Like, what happens if they did just sit there all day? In theory, there must have been. But in practice, they probably could have got away with six hours easily, because they started at sort of lunchtime-ish. There's only one challenge on this day. So they started at lunchtime-ish, and the execution's in the evening. So it doesn't really matter to production, I don't think, how long this challenge lasts. Yeah, my guess is... Maybe they, it's sort of like the rules with Hunted, where you have to move a certain distance within a 10-minute time span or something. Then I could see that being a much more interesting challenge. Where it's like, okay, you got to move at least, say, 5 meters every 20 minutes or something like that. Yeah, the worst challenges, and I do say this a lot, the worst challenges are ones where it's not that fun for the contestants, and it's not that fun for us to watch. This is a prime example of a boring challenge to play and a boring challenge to watch. Yeah, they just needed some other elements or other distractions. Just something that was just way too stripped away. It was just way too thin of a challenge. And don't neglect to remember, this is for an exemption of the finale. This is the most important exemption in the game. I wish they maybe would have done this challenge blindfolded or something just made it even more of a challenge to try and find the flag. Yeah. That must have been a health and safety nightmare if they did that, though. Can you imagine? Tripping over bushes and stuff. Yeah. Then you couldn't really be able to call each other in, or just some other, some alternate way to design this challenge completely. I think they were just on the... They had a good concept for this challenge, 
It's just they couldn't figure out how to work it whatsoever. They just went down. They they thought of a path. They went down that path, and it was clearly the wrong path for this for for this challenge. They had a nice idea, but it was only a half idea, and they never remembered the actual consequence that was needed for it. Makes you wonder what the challenge would have been like if they did this with, say, seven or eight people in the game. Oh, that would have been super interesting. But then you would have had to balance the colours to make sure they weren't super easy to guess. Or do some other way where it's like, okay, somebody just grabbed the flag. Who grabbed the flag? And then you have to guess who grabbed the flag. And not have them wear colours at all. Because, I mean, the fact that the last two people left were ones wearing green and yellow, as you said, Michael, that did blend in with the environment the best. Or alternatively, revolutionary idea. How about you put them in the field, you attach them to a chain, and make it so there's only just enough slack so one of them can reach the centre, and then make it a trust exercise. Oh, what they could have done is say, oh, if one person, let one person earn the exemption, then the pot gets doubled. I'm very surprised that no one has done Chain Gang for Final Four exemption, but Chain Gang for Final Four exemption would be very interesting. Just have a lot of money at stake. Be like, the pot gets doubled. Or just have it really high stakes money-wise. Make it really tense. Say, either the pot gets doubled or the pot gets halved. So yeah, this is a complete stink of a challenge in summary. Yeah. Joachim wins it, he's safe. Yeah, I have no interest in notes here, I don't think. No. Let's move on. So Sanna and Joachim compare war wounds from the challenge. Thomas and Diedrich realise that, assuming Sanna is the mole, as they do assume... One of the two of them will be going home. Deidre proposes that they should put a few questions on Joachim, assuming that she's on one of them fully, and she will go home if she's too focused on one of them, and if she isn't the mole. Yeah, it's a very, very logical strategy where it's like, well, if San is the mole, Joachim's exempt, and both of us think San is the mole, we both go on her, it guarantees one of us goes home. But the only way that both of us survive is if we're wrong, and Joachim is actually the mole, and we both go on Joachim, then Sana goes home. So it's actually a really good strategy on Diedrich's part, if the goal is to get him and Thomas to the final three. So it's now time for the test. 20 questions on the identity and actions of the mole. Whoever knows least will go home, except for the mole who can never go home. Joachim has an exemption. Opta finale. Thomas says it's not a good idea to put everything on Sana. He's sticking with his tactic of spreading over two people. Sana says Thomas sometimes does things that people don't see, which is why he could be the mole. Thanks to her chat with Joachim, she can rule Diedrich out, so she spreads over Thomas and Joachim. Diedrich answers the first question with the mole being a woman, and the last with Joachim being the mole. And that is where the episode ends. And then the worst part is, like, five minutes into the next episode, they have the execution anyway. It's like, do you know how much footage was wasted on pointless crap during this episode? They could have squeezed in an execution. Yet for the only time this season, we are going to do a sort of what the molded section after we say goodbye we're going to actually discuss the results of this execution because there are some things to say about it shall we say so yeah for the first and only time this season we will be asking not what the mole did but what happens next so there will be no guessing of who goes home in fourth because obviously i know and logan does now as well so a couple more minutes and then we will actually discuss what happens at the execution so next time Art takes the finalist to Mole Town before the last assignment that could win them more money than any other in Venom history, and the answer to the ultimate question, V is the Mole. So who are your suspects, Mr. Saunders? Uh, going to the execution, Thomas was number one, Sana's number two, Diedrich number three, Joachim number four. Interesting, and mine at the time were Diedrich, Thomas, then Joachim, then Sana, and the Bothers Bar suspects were Joachim and Thomas equal, then Sanna, and then Diedrich. Have you got anything else you want to say before we officially sign off before our final episode of the year? No. It's interesting to film the final episode of the year in May. Yeah, we're, we're sort of skirting around the fact that we are going to be recording the final episode of the year, let's be honest, nearly seven months in advance. But yeah. I don't think I've got anything else to say either. So, in that case, thank you for listening to our VSDMOL 2017 recap. We'll be back next week to conclude the hunt for the old mole in Oregon. Don't forget you can contact us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram, where we are RTV Warriors, or you can email us and contact at rtvwarriors.com. 
Log in on Twitter at Logsupukwaki, and I'm MJ Harmstone. Thank you as always to Marika for the subtitles, and we'll see you next week for the final two episodes. Peace out and just chill till the next of flavoring. So, Mr. Saunders, shall we discuss what happened at the execution? Dietrich goes home. He does, and I was <laughs> pissed at the time about this. Because <laughs> obviously he's been my number one suspect for about six of the eight weeks. Yeah, and I never I never really suspected him. It was pretty gutting for me watching the start of the next episode, I remember that. But it's really interesting watching this episode knowing Diedrich goes home. Because there is so much content about Diedrich and Tom as being the main threat as a Bond and needing to be split up, and Sana's mission being split up these guys at all costs. And then it happens in the execution in the next episode. It would have been a perfect story to tell in this episode to have the comeuppance of them still being a Bond in this episode, but for some reason they wait another week. Yeah, it really weakens the payoff where it's like, okay, Deidre goes home, and now we gotta do the final three, the rest of the final three episodes. So, yep, you're gone, Diedrich. No one gets to really reflect on that. Or real fun from it. All we get is like a very, very quick scene in the at a rest at like a Denny's or an IHOP style restaurant right after the execution. And it's like, okay, now it's just moved on to the final three. Dietrich's gone. Yeah, and there's still only two challenges next episode as well. Oh, really? They only do two challenges? Yeah, there's only two challenges. It's still a traditional finale in that respect. When do they start doing three challenges with Georgia? Georgia only had two, I think, in the finale. Well, then they have kind of one at the quiz. Well, yeah, I don't really count that as a as a challenge. George is the exception to that rule, anyway. Traditionally, they only do two challenges in the finale now, and have done for years. But yeah, the Mole Town one, and then the very interesting final challenge that I think you're going to have a lot to say about. Anyways, that's it. There's nothing. Diedrich was a great contestant. He was very, very good speaker. Very good in confessionals. He is probably my non emanuela favourite of the season, I have to say. I really like Diedrich. One thing to note, because of the nature of the con- of the contestants that are picked for Venom, since they're all in the entertainment industry, there aren't too many quote-unquote nerdy types that get into Venom, because there's not too many nerdy celebrities in general. It'd be like casting Bill Nye, if you had the American equivalent, <laughs> or Neil deGrasse Tyson. So it's like you got to find some sort of one of those very, very few scientific celebrities and pick them to be on the show. And I'm guessing that's why we don't see too many people like Diedrich on Venom because it's mostly writers or singers and reporters that end up getting cast and actors too. I get the vibe that Diedrich didn't take much persuading to go on Venom. He had an absolute blast despite having to deal with Joachim so much. Yeah, right when he got that exemption early on in the game. Yeah, he always comes across, even post-season, as having really enjoyed his time on the show and being very grateful for the experience. So we got anything else you want to say? Uh, No, I think that's it. Awesome. In that case, we will see you next week.